Good morning. Good morning. Wow. The Lord be with you. First Presbyterian Church wishes to welcome all of you to worship today, whether you're here with us in person or online. If you're visiting with us today, we are so glad that you're here, and we'd ask that you find the orange-colored visitor card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and hand it to the usher who will come around during the offertory. Also, if you would have a prayer request, please fill out a prayer request card and hand that to the usher during the offertory. Uh, there are a number of announcements in your bulletin, and we also have a few folks up here, so who's going first? You might see a lot of tired people around here this morning. I've already seen it. <laughs> but we had a great night last night, very successful um, fundraiser. and. That's thanks to so many people that I couldn't begin to name names. But here's the thing. If you were here last night and had pistachio cheesecake, raise your hand. Did you like the pistachio cheesecake? It was very good, that's what I hear. So we have one, we had one whole cheesecake left. So you didn't get to come. It's in the refrigerator in here. I'd love to say it's free, but no, we don't do that. <laughs> this is a fundraiser. <laughs> there is a silent auction sheet out there on the table. There are already some bids on it, but if you are interested in taking home a whole cheesecake, which can be frozen, correct, Jennifer? Can be frozen for an upcoming event or whatever. Um, what did you say? Well, <laughs> right, you're going to want to just go home and yeah, get right into it, I'm sure. But anyway, it's right in front of the parlor if you missed it. The cheesecake isn't, it's in the refrigerator. But the sheet for the um, silent auction is. I can't tell you how much money we raised yet, but I can promise you it was well over 3,000. I'm sure of that just from what I know. But we'll let you know when we have a final total. Thank you so much, everyone. Just one more final plug for a concert coming up this Saturday evening um, by Capriccio Jubilee a smaller group from the larger Capriccio Columbus group that I sing with, sing with both of these. The concert will be at Grace Methodist Church Saturday evening at seven o'clock. Tickets are, um, it's sponsored by the um, Purse Harlow Endowment Fund um, through the Fayette Charitable Foundation. And tickets are $10 at the door and students are free. Um, it will be a concert of about part of the concert is a piece called the Gospel Mass, which by Robert Ray, which is a gospel piece, um, or a gospel setting of the Mass, but it's all in English, and it's with piano, percussion, and, and bass, and the rest of it is our, our spirituals. And some, some spirituals that will be familiar to you, but in some settings that may not be quite so familiar to you. So, but it's going to be a, a fun concert. It's been a fun concert to be part of, to prepare. And we're, it's the, first, the first of the two concerts will be here in Washington Courthouse. And if you miss it Saturday night and want to hear the same concert, it will be it's Sunday, um, Sunday afternoon. But it'll cost you $20 to get in there instead of $10 here. So, you know, so it's a discount, 50% discount to come hear the concert Saturday evening, Grace Methodist Church, 7 o'clock. And, I'm, and it'll be about an hour and 15 minutes. There is no, no, it's Sunday evening, actually. It's Sunday late. So we hope that you, if you love choral music or you enjoy choral music, I, I guarantee you, you will really enjoy this concert. Thank you. Sounds like a good time. Okay, so just a couple of quick announcements. Um, for the youth, 
the graduating youth scholarship applications are due tomorrow. Please take advantage of that and get your applications turned in. Um, we have also, you should have gotten an email if your youth are interested in going to camp. There was a great camp scholarship that came out from uh, a Presbyterian church in Grand Haven, Michigan. And it was a first come, first serve kind of thing till the money goes away. So um, hopefully you all, if your kids are interested in camp, hopefully you took advantage of that because that's a huge money saver. Um, also, two more things. Next Sunday, the youth, after church, weather permitting, we're going to do a sack lunch, kite flying um, uh, adventure for a couple of hours after church. And we could really use a couple more um, adult volunteers if anybody likes to fly kites or is so inclined to help kids fly kites. Um, that would be great. And I'll try to send an email out on that, or there is an email that's coming out this week. Um, the last thing is on May the 5th, which will be here before you know it, um, Blue Lions are doing another block party this year, and hopefully it won't get canceled because of rain this year. Um, Josh Fickleheimer has volunteered to do a game for anybody who wants to come visit our table and um, is looking for some small prizes to be able to give away for the winners of the game. So I will be sending another email, you're gonna get a couple of them from me this week, um, uh, with a couple of suggestions if you're interested in donating any kind of prizes. If not, we will purchase them, okay? Thank you so much. Next Sunday evening, we're gonna do soup and a movie. We postponed that from what we usually do <laughs> is in Lent, but we, we're gonna do the movie, The Most Reluctant Convert. It's about C.S. Lewis. He wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. And I don't know if any, if you, who, if you know, but he was a ri originally an atheist. And this is about the, the story of his conversion to being a Christian. It's a very gradual thing, you know. What, you atheist, well, maybe there could be a higher being. Well, maybe, 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 until he became a Christian. So um, it's very interesting. It's gonna take two weeks to do it. We'll do half the movie. Uh, we'll eat while the movie's on, have some discussion. So um, I think, I think it's really interesting to see that progression. It's the progression I think most people go through. And if um, some people could go faster than others for sure. But um, um, I just think it's a really interesting way. And it might help those of you who are reaching out to some loved one or some person trying to explain how thing, how, um, what Christianity is. So um, anyway, I hope you'll come. Just it's be a simple meal, soup, and, and, and of course, dessert. So, oh, it's at 5.30, uh, 5.30. <laughs> and um, we will be that move we'll do about a half an hour 45 minutes of movie and eating and then we'll do some discussion so okay sunday sunday april 21st it's in here yeah it's in your bulletin it's in there somewhere okay thank you Are there any other announcements? Please take a moment to share the love and peace of Christ with your brothers and sisters around you. May the peace of Christ be with you.
Let's enter our time of worship in prayer. Redeeming God, as we hear your word spoken to us, open our eyes to see the risen Christ. Open our ears to hear the good news of his salvation for all the world. And open our minds to understand the mysteries of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. The Lord hears us when we call. Come, let us turn trust in God. The Lord fills our hearts with gladness. Come, let us sing God's praises with shouts of joy. The Lord grants peace to our weary souls. Come, let us rest by the quiet waters of God's grace. Now let's all sing together our opening hymn, number 246, Christ is Alive. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> to repent is to turn away from sin and turn toward Christ Jesus. Scripture promises that when we confess, God hears our cries and wipes away our sin. Trusting in God's promises of new life, let us confess our sins and the sin of this world, using the words on the screen. Risen Christ. We are often troubled by our doubts, but you are not troubled by them. You do not require perfect understanding. Instead, you reveal yourself to us again and again, that we might come to know you. Forgive us when our doubts keep us stuck, when fear prevents us from loving all creation as you call us to do. Help us to accept the peace you so graciously offer to us. In resurrection hope, we pray. Amen. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Children of God, we are claimed by God, forgiven of our sins, and set free for love. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen.
questions? The kids want to come forward? Hi. Oh. Whew. Try to do this. Okay. So, well, you guys all know this, I guess. But I'm still going to say it anyway. Um, when uh, Caitlin was littler, uh, every once in a while, she still wants to do it. But when Caitlin was littler, one of the things that she would do to keep herself from having to go to sleep on time was tell me that she had to tell me a story. She wanted to make up a story. You remember that, Caitlin? And we would make up stories, and uh, almost every single story was what, Caitlin? You remember? That's right. So we would tell these stories, and they made no sense whatsoever. But basically what would happen is we would come up with the thing. Usually it was an animal. And the two of us would decide what that animal was trying to go to and what that animal's name was. And I think I'm doing a heck of a lot of feedback, or is that just... Yeah, I'm doing a heck of a lot of feedback if we could... Okay, so what would happen is we'd say there once was a cat named Gerald. Gerald. And that cat Gerald had to go to the gas station for... For... Tuna. Tuna. <laughs> and on the way to the gas station, he passed what other kind of animal? A cow. And that cow's name was? Fred. Fred. <laughs> and I don't remember what the first animal was. Uh, a cat. So then there was this cat, and we'd always remember their names wrong. And then there was this, uh, the other animal? Uh, a frog. A frog. <laughs> a cow. And the cow and the chicken, oh, the cow and the cat. And the cow and the cat were trying to go to the gas station, and I don't remember what for. For tuna, that's right. And so they wanted to go there, and so they said, oh, we'll go together. And then we'd have the cat, the cow, and a chicken. And, a chicken. and the chicken's name was? Fred. That's everybody's not named Fred. Fred. Pickle Man. And Pickle Man had to go to the gas station for what? For bread. For bread. So they said, why don't you come with us to the gas station? And there'd always be four of these, so we need one more. And so there was a cat, a cat, a cow, a chicken, and a pig. And the pig's name was? Raccoon. The pig's name was Raccoon. And what did he need at the gas station? He needed pickles. He should ask Mr. Pickles. And so then these, all these animals made it to the gas station, and when they made it to the gas station, they got their pickle, and they got their milk, and, tuna. and they got their tuna, and, bread. and they got their bread. The end. <laughs> we can't do another one. We'll do another one tonight. And we would do this all of the time. I cannot tell you how many stories we came up with that were basically just that. But I can say that those stories are really important, weren't they, Caitlin? Yes. Even though they were just made up and they were silly and they didn't really mean anything, they were important for us to tell. Because they were what? They were our stories. And each and every one of us has our stories, our own stories. We have stories that are true. We have stories that are made up. We have stories about things we've done. We have stories about places we'd like to go. We have stories about people we've met. 
And it's important that we tell these stories to other people, right? It's important that we tell all our stories to other people. Do you see how many people laughed at one of our silly stories? It's important that we tell these stories. And you have one story, each and every one of us here has one story that's very important that we tell. And that's the story of Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. Jesus loves us, A. Jesus is there for us. Jesus saved us. Jesus cared so much for us that he was born at Christmas, died at Easter, and is alive again. And that's why we come to church. And that's why we pray. And that's why we read our Bibles. And that's why we go to Sunday school. So I hope all of you know that you have important stories to tell. And I hope you tell those stories, especially the story of Jesus and what he does for you. Amen? Great. Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. This is the beginning of the story of the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into this city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. This is the word of God for the people of God. This sermon, um, I think, fits pretty well with last week's sermon in that it's simple in its difficulty. Now, I will say that I stand here before you today as a pastor who loves his denomination, right? I love the Peace USA. I'll tell you there's some wackos in it, but I love it. I am a PCUSA pastor, and I am a proponent, or I said the right thing. I almost thought I said opponent. I am a proponent of the PCUSA. I like most everything they're doing. You're never going to like everything somebody's doing. I like almost everything they're doing. I am always on a committee or a commission. Um, I think over the time since I've been in Newark, I think there was about there was a year I wasn't on a committee or a commission. Um, I try to be involved in the denomination. I try to be uh, involved in the, in the presbytery, the life of the presbytery. Uh, at every church I go to, I convince them to host presbytery meetings. I think it's important. I think it's important that we're part of the presbytery. I think it's important that we're a church 
that is part of the body of Christ and, and our little wing is, is Peace USA and is the denomination. And I think that's important. I started my career at two churches that didn't even pay their per capita. And when I came here, that was one of the things I said. Like, you're not going to go to another church that won't pay per capita. But it hasn't always been that way. I haven't always loved my denomination so much. I haven't always been a person that wanted to be a part of it. I haven't always been a person who has volunteered and who usually, though not all the time, because they'll ask you over and over and over again to do stuff, usually said yes. In fact, I was reminded of that because I was having a very hard time writing this month's newsletter article, and I almost cheated by printing an old one I had written, which I do do from time to time. However... I didn't. I ended up writing a new one. But, but I was looking, and so I was looking through all my old files, and I came across an article from a time in which I went to an entire meeting that was predicated on forming and separating from the Peace USA. And I wrote a letter that I'm kind of offended I wrote now. It was about the need to maybe separate ourselves from the denomination. It wasn't good. I didn't like it. It kind of hurt my feelings, honestly, that I wrote it in the first place. And I couldn't, my, well, I wrote it off as just being young and silly, but that's not really true. For quite a long time, I was a person who wasn't necessarily, well, I was pretty opposed to the denomination and to a lot of things that were happening and a lot of decisions that were being made and a lot of stuff that was happening. And I kind of set myself up as a contrarian to what was happening. And that all changed almost completely overnight. And that's because I had a dream. And in this dream, I was driving down the highway, and I haven't told this yet, right? When you've been a pastor for 12 years, you forget what you tell. But luckily, with computers now, you can type it into the search bar, and it comes up if you wrote it already. Anyway, so I was on the road. I was driving down the road, and next to me on this road was a El Camino. Is it a truck? Is it a car? Who knows? In this El Camino, there was a man trapped inside of a garbage bag, like taped up, trapped inside of a garbage bag, dying in the back of this car or truck, asking for help. And so I sped up to try to help, to try to help this man who was trapped in a garbage bag in the back of this El Camino. And then I noticed who was driving the car and I knew the two people who were driving the car. And for a moment, I'm going to sound mean, and I apologize because sometimes I am mean. The one person who was in the passenger seat was very active in the presbytery and quite frankly, I thought, had no idea what they were doing. That's the mean part. didn't think they knew what they were doing at all. I had a very low opinion of this person. Whether that is, should be accurate or not, it makes sense for the story, and it makes sense for the dream. So the person in the passenger seat of this El Camino that has a person in the back dying inside of a garbage bag was a person that I didn't think very highly of, a person that I really didn't think was a very good passer but also a person who is very active in the presbytery. Now the person in the driver's seat, I'm going to give away some details, and if you went on the Google machine, you would be able to find out who this person was, but he was the moderator of presbytery. And everybody, this is a different presbytery, so no, it's not Dick. He was a moderator of presbytery, and everybody loved him. And for some reason, I didn't. I don't know why. 
But he was in charge of everything, and everyone loved him. He talked regularly at Montreat. He was everywhere. He was at one of the only churches in the Presbytery, this is Cleveland, that was growing. He was, from all intents and purposes, doing a great job. And for some reason, not, I didn't really like him. But this person was driving the car. Right? And then I woke up. But not all the way. Have you ever had that? Where you wake up, but you're not awake. I woke up, and I heard a very distinct voice. And this distinct voice said that the El Camino is the church. It said that the person in the back are all of the people in the church. It said that the person in the passenger seat was the fact that a lot of people running the church don't know what they're doing. And the person in the driver's seat is a person, and this is 100% true, who knows what they should be doing and isn't. And you think, this is to me, that you don't need to be a part of leading the church. And that was my dream. Fast forward a couple years, and that person who was running the Presbytery, moderating the Presbytery, that person everybody likes, turns out that that person was a sexual predator. I can't say that my dream had anything to do with that, but that person ended up being a sexual predator. So the point is after this story, I said, well, boy, I'm supposed to be a part of leading the church. How can I sit here as a constant contrarian? How can I sit here and be a person so vocal against things? How can I be a person like that and have no stake in the action and not be a leader in this group and not even serve on a committee or a commission or a group, not go to things? not attend anything but Presbytery meetings? How can you? You can't. And so from that point on, I've tried very hard to be a part of the Presbytery because I believe that that was God's word to me. I believe that not that I have special skills and abilities that other people don't have, not that I don't very often have no idea what I'm doing, and not that I don't very often know what I'm supposed to do and still not do it. But God's word to me that night was that I was supposed to be a part of the leadership of the church. And I tell you that since I have been a part of the leadership of the church, my opinions on almost everything has changed. My opinions on the goodness or badness of the leaders, my opinions on the denomination, my opinion on what is involved, my opinion on all of that is raw, is different, as different as light and darkness could possibly be, as different as possible. And now that I believe that our denomination is one of the denominations that has the best chance of seeing the church turn around. And now I believe that our domination needs to be a much more vocal presence in the world than it is. I know that's a big compliment to the church. But what I want to say is that you receive, when you receive a word from God, we need to act on that word. Right? When you receive a word from God, you need to act on that word. Is it not true? If you receive a word from God, should you act on it? Yes, thank you. If you receive a word from God that you should feel loved, should you feel loved? If you feel and you see and you hear a word from God that you should work for peace and justice, should you do it? If you hear a word from God that God loves you, and has a plan for your life, should you do that? Should you listen to it? Should you act on it? 
If God says don't be anxious, if God says be at peace, if God says love your neighbor, if God says act on that feeling in your heart, if God says act on that intuition, that's not just intuition. If God gives you a word that a friend or a neighbor needs to hear, if God gives you a word or a story that your neighbors need to hear, that the church needs to hear, that the church leaders need to hear, that the people in the pews need to hear, that the folks that aren't in the pews, that the people that use Persinger Hall all week need to hear, that the folks in our community and our town need to hear, then what do we have to do? It's not, we have to share it, right? We have to tell it. We have to say it. And we have to give it. And here's where last week's sermon connects up with this week's sermon. Because last week's sermon, in the end, not to get too simple, the whole point of the sermon is that you need to read your Bible. Right? And not only do you need to read your Bible, but sometimes you need to just read your Bible and not read what commentators say and not read what the pastor has to say and not read what the notes at the bottom of your Bible has to say. Sometimes, those are all good things, don't get me wrong, Sometimes you got to just read it. And you might need a dictionary, because there's some words in there. But you need to read it. That's where it connects up to today's sermon. Because sometimes, maybe not every day, you're going to read the Word of God, and what are you going to get? A word from God. You're going to read the Word of God, and you're going to get a word from God. It's crazy how that happens. And that's why I say sometimes you've got to just read the Bible and not read the commentaries and not read the notes in the bottom and not read what your pastor says and not read what your favorite YouTube guy has to say or person has to say because you get a word from God from the Word of God. And if you just get the Word of God from me, then what are you getting? You're getting the Word of God to me, to you. And that's good. But when you read it yourself, you're getting a Word of God to you. And when you get a Word of God, you need to act on it. You need to do something about it. And sometimes the Word of God is simple. Sometimes the Word of God is just reassurance. Sometimes the Word of God that comes from the Word of God will just be assurance. Will be something that says, you're okay. Sometimes it'll be a thing that you need to change about yourself. Sometimes it'll be something you need to work on. Sometimes it'll be something that makes you say, man, I really need to work on a relationship I have. Sometimes it's going to be any number of really simple and really normal things, good things, and maybe things you need to work on, negative things, things that confront us and things that assure us. We're going to get words of God, words from God, where we read the word of God. But sometimes... The word you get from God makes you change drastically. It makes you look at a presbytery that you thought was silly and say, I need to be a part of that. It makes you change how you pastor. It makes you change how you act. It makes you change how you live. It makes you change how you be a father. It makes you change how you're a mother. It makes you change how you're a kid. It makes you change how you live in this world. It makes you change how you act as a person in your, in your state and business. And that's why it's dangerous to read your Bible. And that's why it's dangerous to read the Bible on your own. And I think that sometimes that's why we don't want to read it. Because we're afraid we'll get a word from God, from the Word of God, and have to act on it. Today's scripture is a story of Paul. And obviously it's a much more drastic word from God than most of us might ever receive in our whole lives. But it's a word that God, that Paul received and which he changed from Saul to Paul. It changed him so much he had to change his name. It changed him from being a person who persecuted Christians, the followers of the way, to being a person who wanted to make people and convert people and teach people and preach people, to go being from a proponent to an opponent, a opponent to a proponent. 
It made him change his life. And he changed his life, and he told his story. And if you look here at the beginning of Paul's story, you look here at the beginning of Paul's story in Galatians, it seems to me like if I was starting to tell this story and I was trying to write a letter, there's some things I might have left out. I might have left out that I was a bad guy, right? But he had his story and he needed to tell it, just like I told the kids. And it says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not a human origin. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received a revelation from Jesus Christ. And, you know, sometimes I think as Christians that we see that word revelations, a revelation from Jesus Christ, and we think it only means these drastic things like Paul to Saul to Paul, these drastic things that completely change our lives. But you could receive a, a revelation from God that says, I love you. You can receive a word from God, a revelation from God that says your opinion matters. You can receive a word from God that says, I have a story that needs told. You can receive a word from God that says, I'm good enough. You can receive a word from God that says, you drink too much Diet Coke. You could receive any sorts of these things. For you have heard, it says in verse 13, of my previous way of life in Judaism. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in, in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. Kind of a reference back to last week's sermon. Verse 17. I did not go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to get accredited with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles. Only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God, what I'm writing to you is no lie. Do you see how intensely he is trying to prove to each and every one of us that what he received was a word from God, not a recycled message from people? And then I went to Syria and Sicilia. I was personally known to the church, unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. And they praised God because of me. If Paul is anything, he is an example of the fact that when the word of God is given to you, you must act on it. Even if it changes everything about your life, and it certainly changed everything about Paul and Saul, or Saul to Paul. It certainly changed everything for him. He went from being a man following after the traditions of his fathers, a man who was persecuting the church, a man who was advancing in Judaism, a man who was advancing along the Pharisees' route, to being a man who was preaching the gospel of Christ to his brothers and sisters of the Gentiles all around the Roman Empire. A change, a drastic change on which he had to tell his story and he had to change his life based on this word from God. And so today, I hope that you take last week's chapter and you read that word. Take some time. It doesn't have to be long. Read the word. Try to understand what it says. And act on what it tells you. Don't be scared to receive a word from God from the word of God. Amen. Let's all stand up together and sing number 309.
Living Lord, we give you thanks for the bounty of your grace. You create us in your image and shower us with your love. Bless these gifts we offer you today and make us good stewards of the resources you have entrusted to us. May our gifts bring joy and peace to our church and in our community. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you and please be seated. We have two prayer requests in um, from the congregation. We have to please continue to pray for the Woolham family as they grieve the loss of their daughter. And the prayers for uh, the family of Ted Mackey as Ted passed away on Friday. So any prayers would be appreciated. Lord God, we come before you today in prayer. We come before you today longing, desiring to hear words from you. Lord God, we pray that we all be encouraged to read our scriptures and to act on what we've learned. Internally, externally, by telling our stories, by believing the promises of the gospel, by acting on those times in which you push us to become better people by acting on those times on which you have plans for us, those times in which you have active purposes for us in this world. We pray for the wonderful meal and day that we had yesterday, the Luigi dinner. We pray that the money raised do well, that as it goes to cancer research and to pelotonia, that better cures and better treatments and better life expectancies be made. May you multiply the money that we have given, the money that we have raised, so that it do well, that it helps people in this world get better and not be sick. Lord God, it reminds us to pray for all those who are in and fighting and overcoming some kind of cancer, we see on the back of our bulletin so many folks that we love and care for that have some kind of cancer. And we pray for each and every one of them. We pray for each and every one of them that you work in their lives and in their bodies for the good. Lord, we know that some of the other folks on our backs of our bulletins are dealing with cancer and other things. And so we pray for them as well. And at this time, we especially pray for those who are suffering loss, for the family of Ted Mackey and for the Woolham family, Lord God. Be with them as they suffer and grieve the loss of their loved one. Be with them and grant them peace, peace, courage, and comfort as they face this loss and continue to face it daily. We pray for our people gathered here today Lord God, we pray for a good week, a week in which all of us leave this place and carry the message and the gospel forward into the community around us. And let us continue to pray by saying that which you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's all stand and sing our closing hymn.
let's all go forth in the love of God, the peace of Christ Jesus, and the united power of the Holy Spirit. Amen?